All right. Hello. Welcome. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, I am very pleased today to introduce Eric Krauss, um, um, who will be giving today's lecture on a neurovascular topic that you can see on the board here. Um, Eric um, is one, uh, has been a, a long time um, clinician in our department here. He uh, um, went to residency here at uh, UW and graduated here. Before that, he his roots are from uh, Minnesota. Um, and he has cold and snow in his blood if you've ever seen him ski. Um, anyway, Eric is our uh, one of our master clinicians in the neurology department, and we're very pleased uh, to uh, have him speak today. So I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to try and talk to you today about a subject that I have found difficult for years and years, and I finally put together a lecture to try and teach myself but explain it to all of you, and that's when people come in and they have uh, increased tone of some kind. So here's a typical case that I might hear. 58-year-old man is a new patient in clinic for lower extremity uh, cramps, started four years ago and have been getting worse. It's intermittent but daily and involves the calves and the thighs. Uh, and the exam shows. So we'll start with the history and that is, uh, this is at least confusion for me, but patients really use two main terms when they come in with increased tone. They usually say they have either cramps or spasms. And the real question is, is do they really mean that they have a cramp or a spasm? Because there are lots of things that can look like that, act like that, and people get confused about. And so what I hope to tell you today is about all the other things that can cause increased tone in people uh, and <coughs> how you can start to localize this and come up with some answers for people. So uh, my approach to increased tone, this is difficult, but uh, the final common pathway when somebody comes in and says they have increased tone in their muscles is actually a contraction of their muscle. But it may come from the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system uh, or the muscle itself. So the first thing to do, I always say, is localize first to where you think the problem is coming from. Try to be accurate about the name you apply. Even if somebody comes in and says they're having cramps, they may not be, and you want to call it by its correct name. Uh, differential uh, testing is needed, we'll talk about a little bit, and then of course there might be treatment, which is beyond the scope of this lecture today. Here is a slide that is a little small, but has different types of tone that I've organized into the seven levels of the nervous system that I like to divide things into. Uh, so you can see there's a, a lot of things up there, and uh, sometimes names like rigidity can be in two different parts of the uh, nervous system. But what I really want to do today is just get us into the habit of thinking about what types of tone come from the central nervous system and what types of tone come from the peripheral nervous system. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm just going to stop just for a second and get a handout that I had for people. It's actually a one-page handout that has this information on there for you, um, so you can follow along. Now, what you might be thinking to yourself is, I choose to remain naive because it was much easier if I thought only cramps and spasms were occurring. And the second thing you might uh, say is, looking at some of these names, is that somebody fairly crazy named all these things. For instance, there's tetanus, but also tetany. There are spasms and spasticity and tonic spasms, and how do all these things differ, and why they, do they name them so close together? So I hope to shed some light on that as we go through this. So my goal today is going to be to talk about why our muscles contract, why we have increased tone, and talk about each one of these conditions, help you with localization, and show you, for the most part, a video on each one of these about what these types of tone look like. All right, so we'll take the central nervous system first. 
And the central nervous system, the localization for your increased tone may come from the cortex, problems in your basal ganglia, frontal lobe, spinal interneurons, or the cortical spinal tract. And so let's take rigidity first. So many of you uh, uh, have had trouble deciding between what is rigidity and what is spasticity. So rigidity is generally not a painful process. Uh, it is usually a constant feeling of increased tone that is velocity independent. Okay? That means that if I move the arm slow, I'm going to feel the increased tone, just like if I move the arm fast, I'm still going to feel the increased tone. That differs from spasticity, which usually there isn't much increased tone if you do something slow, but with spasticity you get more tone if you try to move it really fast. So rigidity, we say it's usually velocity independent, except for one example that I'll talk to you about. And we use some other terms then to describe what we're feeling. The first is a lead pipe feeling. This is when increased tone is in flexion and extension on a limb in uh, all areas. A variant of lead pipe is when people have cogwheel rigidity. And that means that in addition to the increased tone throughout the range of motion, they also have a sort of a catch as it goes around a little bit. The tone in between is not normal, though, but they just seem to have a catch as they go a cogging to it. And that's most often seen in the Parkinson diseases. Uh, and then there's a type of tone that's referred to as laxy flexibility, a type of rigidity, which is, again, a variant of lead pipe in which the body position can be molded and sort of stays in a certain position for long periods of time. So the way to make a diagnosis of rigidity because of the, uh, where this comes from could be just with your physical exam. For instance, key features of Parkinson's disease uh, might be a brain MRI scan if you're looking for, say, iron deposition in the basal ganglia or uh, something else. Medication review, of course, because sometimes we get Parkinson-like syndromes when people are on neuroleptic medications and anti-nausea uh, medications. And I'll just show you uh, a couple examples here. The first is of uh, rigidity. This is a doctor moving this person's arm backwards and forwards. So flexion and extension are stiff. And you can look closely. There's a little bit of sort of give uh, back and forth, a little bit of cogging in that as well. Uh, And just an example of uh, waxy flexibility. I'll get to the part where this is occurring, but this is a doctor interviewing a man with uh, schizophrenia or catatonic features. And he's just going to move the arm that's hard to move, so has a lead pipe consistency to it and then just positions the arm and leaves it. And you can see that the patient just keeps the arm that way, that sort of a waxy flexibility uh, tone, a type of rigidity. All right, the last type of rigidity I want to talk about is also not painful, and it's a, it's a type of rigidity we refer to as either peritonia or gegenhalten. And you've probably also all witnessed this as well. This is a type of tone where there's resistance to passive movement that actually increases, though, with uh, increasing velocity. Uh, most often seen in patients who are delirious, demented, uh, uh, or have altered consciousness of some kind. Um, and it's really involuntary inflection and extension. So they, they essentially, every time you try to move them, they're just going to resist you in every movement that you make. Very common in older people in the hospital that we see on our services to have this. Trying to move the neck on somebody with peritonia is often very hard and gets mixed up with people who you think might have meningitis because <coughs> it looks like they have uh, uh, um, neck stiffness. Okay, next topic is seizures. So the location for a seizure is going to be the cortex. And there are some times when seizures occur that cause just a focal tone issue without the clonic movement. And in general, that's going to come from the supplementary motor area rather than the motor cortex itself, which would usually be a jerking movement. Seizures are typically sudden onset. Uh, almost all seizures have a duration of less than two minutes. 
uh, except status epilepticus, which is uh, rare, but is usually short. Uh, there uh, can be flexion or extension in this tone, and oftentimes the seizure may stay focal, but it could spread to other parts of the body, and the more it spreads, the more uh, disruption of your consciousness you're going to have. It can occur in the, in the upper or lower extremities and may be preceded by an aura. Obviously, the helpful ways to make a diagnosis of seizure is going to be with an EEG and some kind of imaging. And I'll show you an example of somebody with a tonic seizure here. So a young man sitting in a chair eating some soup when he suddenly has an event that causes his left arm to go up and his head to go down. So a lot of increased tone there without jerking for a focal tonic seizure. fairly rapidly comes back. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the next topic, which is a dystonia. Dystonias are increased tone as well. They're sort of a sustained muscle contraction. You usually think, though, when you have a dystonia that your head moves in one position and stays there, or your hand moves in one position. But in fact, dystonia morphs into athetosis and twisting movements as well. So lots of people that might have a dystonia might have a little movement to it as they are holding their position. People with toracolis often sort of turn it back and move it like this a little bit. So it's not just a fixed posture, but it's, it's, it's the least movement of the group of movements that fall on the spectrum of dystonia to belizness, right? Dystonia is more fixed, athetosis is more moving, chorea is even more moving, and belizness is the highest frequency moving, but they all fall along a spectrum. And so we often describe diseases as choreoathetosis or an athetoid dystonia because frankly they have both features and we're unable to say exactly what they have. So dystonias uh, uh, can be hereditary, such as in DYT1 mutations or dopa-responsive dystonias, may be acquired if you're using neuroleptics and other drugs. Uh, they can be constant, so people may have dystonia sort of all the time, or paroxysmal, such as kinesiogenic uh, paroxysmal dystonia or dyskinesia that some people have after exercise and such. They may be generalized segmental and focal, one type of focal dystonia that I like to bring people up is this writer's cramp, it's called. It's not really a cramp, actually. Cramps come from peripheral nerve disease. This is a basal ganglia problem in which people's hands will uh, go into a dystonic uh, 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 posture as they're writing, and they're often uh, quite painful for people as well. So the workup for somebody with a dystonia, because it's a brain basal ganglia problem, might be an MRI scan, genetic studies for certain types, Medication review for sure. This is a posture which are often sort of grotesque and really contracted in people with chronic dystonia. <coughs> and I'll show you a couple pictures here. One of a writer's cramp. So this is a woman who's writing. And I'll move it along just a little bit here, I guess. But she's writing along. Her hand looks pretty normal at first. She's able to write. And as you watch her uh, continue to write, she starts to have some posturing of her hand a little bit, making it harder to write. You can see her hand is turning over a little bit. Her fingers are clenching a little bit more. And this is typical of a writer's dystonia, a writer's cramp, which is a little bit more normal at first. And as the more you do, it sort of gets dystonic. You have to shake it out a little bit, and you might be able to start again. Many people who have uh, musical dystonias who do some instrument may start getting something just in these particular task-specific situations. Patricia? Do you know, I mean, not that it would be hard, of course, but if they push ready on the other side or do something on the other side, maybe they get on the other side? Yeah, so the question was, if they start using their other hand and writing with the other hand, will they also get a dystonia over there? I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, for treatment for this, you can do some restraint therapy, Botox therapy, or teach people to write with the other side, although I would find that very difficult to try and do. 
but I would think it might stay focal in this situation, but I'm sure there are examples of bilateral. And anybody who knows the answers to that can chime in. In most of the models from animal studies, it's it's not. It's like yeah, unilateral. Unilateral. That's uh, the answer from the crowd. Here is uh, somebody with cervical dystonia symptoms. He's talking a little bit, but the sound isn't important. And you'll see he just has movements of his neck either forward or side to side. And in addition, he's got a little bit of a dystonic tremor associated with that, which uh, could be part of the disease or his fight against the movement of his neck. And the eye movements are part of it? Uh, I, um, I'm not sure. I think he was explaining that he said sometimes he looks up, but I don't think probably the eye movements are part of it. I think he can hold it pretty still if he wants, but then there's some purposeful control over dystonia as well. People who concentrate a lot and fight against it can. There's some sensory tricks that can be used. People can touch their neck or their head sometimes, or uh, I saw one video, somebody just puts their hand behind their back and it stops their dystonia a little bit. All right. The next level we're getting down to now is uh, has to do with stiffness and tightness. <laughs> and this is the disease of the spinal interneura. So we have sensory fibers that come from our uh, tendons that go up to our spinal cord, will hit an inner neuron attached to a motor uh, anterior motor cell, and then go out for a reflex, for instance. But we have these inner neurons that are present in between uh, the, the different nerves of the, of the, of the spinal cord. And uh, these uh, inner neurons are inhibitory, and they use glycine and GABA for their inhibition. So if you were to block the inhibition of the spinal inner neurons, that would lead to a persistent, involuntary, continuous motor activity of the muscle and the limb. Uh, and that's called CMUA, continuous uh, motor unit activity. So an example of stiffness would be somebody who has stiff person syndrome. This is most often caused by antibodies that actually block the GAD uh, enzyme, the glutamic acid decarboxylase enzyme, which is the rate limiting stack for the production of GABA. I just told you that. GAB and glycine are the inhibitory neurotransmitters that we're using at this level. There's also a perineoplastic variant of this disease from amphiphysin antibodies. I have to say I didn't look up to see where they act exactly, but oftentimes in stiff person syndrome, the muscles of the trunk and the proximal muscles of the hips are affected first, and they have this constant increased contraction that can be stimulated by even auditory noise, by stress, by touching somebody, they can have increased stiffness in their muscles. And for a very long time, stiff person syndrome was thought to be psychological because of the, uh, of the way that just clapping would cause somebody to stiffen up. They thought that could hardly be something organic or neurologic, but in fact, uh, it is. And so the diagnosis of somebody with stiff person syndrome, of course, would start with a physical exam. Uh, because they're so stiff, they have sort of a spastic, rigid quality. You'd probably image their spine and brain. Some labs might be helpful for this, such as looking for GAD antibodies in the blood. And then finally, when you stick a needle into somebody who has stiff person syndrome, you're looking for continuous motor unit activity. And so you stick a needle into the muscle and you ask the person to relax. And usually when that happens, there's no sound on the EMG. And in somebody who can't relax because they're getting ongoing stimulation of the motor uh, anterior uh, horn cell, they'll have continuous motor unit activity. I'll just show you somebody diagnosed with stiff person syndrome and what their gait looks like. I guess one would call that as a stiff gait. Eric, do you think there's anything clinically that would distinguish this from some form of dystonia? Uh, clinically, like a, um, generalized dystonia. I would say 
from my experience, when people have dystonia in the legs and the feet, their foot often goes in and sort of inverts, and I haven't seen that in the few people I've seen with stiff person syndrome, but that might be something. Uh, and a dystonia just of the legs and not of the arms, that might be pretty rare, I guess, too. Reflexes are typically hyperactive because without the interneurons reducing that reflex, uh, they're going to be increased. What would you do to distinguish that from a psychogenic gait? What would you do to distinguish that from a psychogenic gait is the reason. It is true that uh, you can just about mimic any movement disorder out there, any tone problem, uh, if you practiced enough. So I would say you'd be looking to see if there was actual stiffness going on. You could do the EMG. They often have hyperlordosis that's pretty severe in people with stiff person syndrome. Uh, so many people have been diagnosed with psychological problems in this situation. So somebody said the hyperlordosis is a good clue, but probably not present with everybody, and that's true. No sign is probably present in everybody who has the disease. Yeah. Do they have variability? Because you know, sometimes we'll watch somebody when they're in the clinic and know when they're being watched. So uh, there's a difference in the character of their gait. Yeah, do they have variability? So stiff person syndrome is uh, something that can be increased, again, with auditory uh, stimuli, physical stimuli, as well as stress stimuli, so it's possible that it could change. And I think most diseases never have a fully constant feature to it. There's always a little bit of up and down to it as well. But certainly if you saw somebody jump off the table, run to the bathroom, and uh, could do that, and then when you watch them, they couldn't, that would be a sign that it was psychogenic. Okay, how about the term tetanus? Tetanus uh, really refers to people who have been infected with uh, Clostridium tetani. Uh, it has a very powerful toxin called tetanospasmin, and it is acquired from the soil. And how you get this is you get it in your skin, and then this toxin actually gets transported up the axon all the way up by uh, your nerve to your spinal cord where it affects the interneurons uh, up there. Um, it can affect the shorter nerves first because it takes less time to get to the central nervous system, and so jaw clenching or trismus might be seen. Um, and uh, uh, this, too, can be stimulated or increased by tactile, auditory, and visual stimuli. So if you've ever seen somebody with tetanus in the hospital, usually you want a dark, quiet room without a lot of interruptions and a lot of benzodiazepines to help them out with uh, this. But uh, tetanus, so I'll just show a picture up here. There are lots of different types of inner neurons, but one type of inner neuron is really a feedback loop from an alpha motor neuron, and it's called a Renshaw cell. And so when, you, uh, when this cell is stimulated, it gives some feedback to sort of uh, depress the, the activity of the alpha motor neuron. And so if you block this inhibitory Renshaw cell so you're not releasing glycine, uh, at the alpha motor neuron uh, synapse, uh, you're going to get increased activity of the alpha motor neuron, continuous motor unit activity. And the picture down here, by uh, a portrait by Sir Charles Bell of a soldier who had tetanus and had this posturing, a pisitonus posture, which is a very arched back posture. Uh, it's said that with tetanus that you can uh, flex your muscles and arch so bad that you break your bones uh, with this. I've never seen that before and probably have seen one case of tetanus in my life, but I don't know if anybody else has any experience out there. All right, moving on to spasticity. And the difference between rigidity and spasticity is often a difficult one to talk about, but um, uh, spasticity is really a problem of the pyramidal system. So going from the upper motor neuron BET cell through the uh, internal capsule down through the spinal cord uh, to the anterior horn cell. So this is said to be velocity dependent. And there are two types of, uh, of spasticity that I want to talk about. The first is something called blocking. And this is somebody who gets increased tone with fast movement at the end of the movement. So somebody might, uh, you might take their arm and you move it slow and they work just fine. 
and then you take their arm and you move it fast, and as you're moving it fast, it initially goes okay, and then it catches and stops, sort of fast catch and stop. That's a blocking type of spasticity. A second type we call a clasp knife type of spasticity, and that's just the opposite. That's when you uh, take somebody and move their arm fast, and it's a lot of tone at first, and then it just gives way. That's class knife, and it comes from looking at knives like this, pocket knives, in which when you open the knife, you want it to be stiff and not collapse on you, so you could cut something, but then when you close the knife, there's a spring, so that when you get close to where it's going to end up closing, you just let it go, and it springs shut. That's where the term came from, clasp knife. So again, you start out heavy, be a lot of tone, and then just sort of give way at the end, as opposed to blocking, which is easy at first, okay, and then it just stops and slow at the end. Clues, obviously, to a pyramidal system, and if you're trying to figure out the difference between rigidity and spasticity, it would be looking at other things, because rigidity is an extra pyramidal problem. You would not expect to get all these other problems of weakness, hyperreflexia, upgoing toes, and such. But with spasticity, because it involves the pyramidal system, you would expect to see these other features along with it. So the diagnosis of somebody's spasticity mainly comes from uh, things like physical exam. Uh, labs might be helpful, like B12 deficiency can affect the pyramidal system. And obviously, imaging might be a way to go with tumors and spinal stenosis and demyelinating disease and all the other diseases that can affect your pyramidal system. There's the bedside testing that we've just talked about. There's also some testing in the legs. I was trying to find a video for it, didn't find a good one, so I just uh, passed by that right now. And that brings us to the last one in the central nervous system, which is to talk about something called a tonic spasm. And this really is just extra increased tone or a spasm that people who already have spasticity uh, get. Uh, and it can be spontaneous or triggered. And the most common example of this probably is somebody who has cervical myelopathy, like I'm showing here, who has stenosis here at the two, three, four, five, six, uh, five, six level here, pressing on the spinal cord. And what happens is these people have a spastic gait, their tone in their legs is really quite high, uh, but sometimes when they're just laying down on the table or sitting on the table, uh, they'll in addition just have a movement that just sort of goes like this for a little bit and then lets out, just kind of spasms up a little bit. Uh, that's called a tonic spasm, and it's very common in pyramidal system disease. In fact, um, I've had several occasions where I've been doing EMGs on people, and uh, somebody thought they might have a peripheral nervous system problem, but in fact, I stick a needle in or touch their legs, and their legs spasm up like that, and I know right away that this is a central nervous system problem. It's a tonic spasm. So it's a brief jerk and then a relaxation. Uh, it's a, uh, the question was, how is that different than a myoclonus? And that's a very good question. I didn't put myoclonus on my list of things. I could have added that in. Uh, myoclonus uh, can also be a very sort of brief jerk. It usually doesn't have a slow relaxation phase to it. And for uh, most part, if myoclonus is the only thing going on, you wouldn't have these other pyramidal system defects in your exam at the same time. But uh, in general, I think of its pyramidal system as sort of a brief jerk with a slower relaxation that's probably a tonic spasm. Uh, but myoclonus just means brief muscle jerk, so I guess there's some crossover in the terminology. And do we have spasticity? In somebody with a tonic spasm, you would expect spasticity to be part of your exam, right? Is this synonymous with triple flexion? Ah, I'm going to get to that in just a second. Very good. So, uh, the reason why people have these increases in tones may be several. It may be a reflex reaction, like touching the leg and causing it to spasm up a little bit, a reflex, because you don't have these inhibitory fibers from above coming down. You've interrupted that central pathway. Or you might have what we call a faptic transmission, the idea that if you have central nervous system uh, nerve function that is abnormal, uh, 
uh, that you might have a signal going up part of the nerve that can transfer over to another part of the nerve and come back down the nervous system and activate something. So a afferent nerve that uh, signals an efferent nerve just through a damage that's happening in the nerve and poor myelination, sort of an electrical transfer signal uh, can do it. And Thank you, Max. So your diagnosis in somebody with a tonic spasm would be to do physical exam again, looking for these pyramidal tractus function, as well as MRI, brain, and spine. Uh, triple flexion is one example of that, actually. So if you have somebody who's in a coma in the ICU, and you go and you scratch their foot or pinch their leg, and their toe goes up, their heel goes up, their knee goes back, their hip goes up, that's called a triple flexion, and it's just really a tonic spasm that is occurring. I'll show you a, a tonic spasm that's a little bit longer in somebody with uh, neuromus sorry, uh, NMO. This is from the American Academy of Neurology video, but here's somebody who has got neuromus uh, a neuromyelitis, sorry, NMO. Uh, Neuromyelitis optica. So this is an un involuntary movement of the hands in this person who just has uh, extra tone on top of her spasticity that's causing her hand to clench like this. And you can see how long this lasts. It, tonic spasms don't have to be super short, so that'd be one way to figure out if it's myoclonus or not, but sometimes you can have a longer reaction uh, to this. How many people have seen somebody with multiple sclerosis who has tonic spasm, which is relatively common? Best treatment is probably carbamazepine to uh, help that. Are these quite painful? They uh, absolutely can be painful, yeah. They don't have to be painful? I think they would usually be painful to people to have this muscle contraction that was stained uh, like this. Uh, for somebody with just a tonic spasm from uh, spinal stenosis, no, in general, people generally don't say that it's a painful process when I've seen it. Okay, a little more than halfway through, we're going to jump now to different types of tone that come from a peripheral nervous system disease. And the first one on the list, again, is the thing that people most commonly say they have, which is a cramp. But uh, in peripheral nervous system disease, we have two main areas of localization. Either the motor nerve or neuron is affected or the muscle is affected, giving you the increased tone. And in general, uh, peripheral nervous system increased tone diseases are painful, almost always. Whereas in the central nervous system, like in rigidity and such, they often aren't painful. So that's a, a one distinction that you can make. So a cramp. So a cramp is not just a contraction of the muscle. A cramp is a high-frequency discharge of the nerve that makes a muscle cramp. Um, and so it has to be a disease of the lower motor neuron or nucleus. And for the most part, cramps are very localized. When you have a cramp, it's just your calf muscle or just your thigh. It's not regional. It's not your whole leg or your whole side of your body or something. It's going to be very localized for people. Um, it's often nocturnal. It occurs, I bet most of you have woken up with a cramp in your calf at some point in your life. Uh, Post-exercise is common. They're usually very short in duration. You can feel the muscle contract actually and palpate it and stretching often provides very immediate relief. We're going to be talking about some tone problems in the, in the peripheral nervous system in which stretching will not help what they're feeling. And really, it's a high-frequently discharge of motor units. I just want to show you a picture of what a motor unit is. The definition of a motor unit is a single anterior horn cell and all the different muscle fibers that it goes to within a given muscle. Now, this is uh, just showing three muscle fibers for each one of these uh, motor neurons or motor units. But in fact, uh, in many muscles, like your thigh, you have a couple hundred muscle cells for every uh, motor anterior horn cells. So motor units can be fairly big. So your diagnosis will be with a physical exam and EMG. If people have denervation of muscle, they're more likely to get cramps. And so many times people with bad cramps have neuropathies and have denervation. 
Uh, there are other reasons, though, systemic reasons for cramps, like abnormalities of calcium, magnesium, metabolism, dehydration, uremia, many drugs can cause cramps as well. And I found a uh, disturbing uh, video of somebody with a cramp here, actually, uh, that they're doing on purpose somehow. But here's somebody who is just tightening his muscle for a little bit, and now you're going to start to see it. <laughs> You can't hear it, but in the sound of the video, he's yelling quite loudly at this point. But uh, he tightened it up for so long and has a, maybe some disease, but he's actually having a cramp there locally in one muscle. How is this hilarious? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you can put anything on uh, YouTube you want. Yeah. Actually, uh, actually, the truth is he was yelling and his friends were laughing at him. That's, that's, exact, that's what was happening. <laughs> I might have, and they didn't sound like medical students, no. <laughs> okay, so what do we call a spasm when it comes from something in the peripheral nervous system? And as opposed to tonic spasms, which is a word we use for central nervous system spasms, uh, we might refer to this rather as a clonic spasm, and it has more of a myoclonic short look to it than tonic spasms do. But this too is intermittent increased tone, likely due again to white matter effaptic transition, uh, transmission, which I just showed you, which is the passage of electrical activity between nerves so that it can go in different pathways up and down the nerve in the absence of a neurotransmitter activating the nerve. So it's just electrical signal crossing nerves. Um, these are usually shorter in duration, as we've talked about, than things in the central nervous system and often can be painful. And uh, a workup for this would again be a physical exam. Um, for the example I'm going to give you of hemifacial spasm, you might need a brain MRI scan, but for other types of spasms, you might need other things. But the most common cause of hemifacial spasm is actually an artery that's pressing on the seventh cranial nerve, causing a focal demyelinated area, so you have the ability for this effactic transmission to go between nerves, and I'll just show you a video of somebody with hemifacial spasm. You can see her eyebrow goes up, her face goes to the side, she's activating a lot of her seventh cranial nerves over there, and it stays limited to the seventh cranial nerve, so you could be sure that it's probably not a seizure, although that can be mixed up sometimes. If it's hemifacial spasm, it should just be the facial muscles. A seizure probably gets you know, the palate and the tongue and, and other parts of the body at the same time. But that's hemifacial spasm. Would you have to see Bell's palsy? Uh, hemifacial spasm, so the question was, is it Bell's palsy? So it turns out that uh, some patients uh, who get hemifacial uh, spasm, it is a consequence of a previous injury to the nerve that might be referred to as Bell's palsy if it's idiopathic. And as the nerve tries to heal, it doesn't heal perfectly, and you might get this syphactic transmission within the seventh cranial nerve. So yes, it can. Most of the time, though, uh, sort of generic uh, hemifacial spasm is due to vascular compression of the seventh cranial nerve. All right, the term tetany, as opposed to tetanus, which is clostridium tetani. Tetany is a process in the peripheral nervous system in which you have involuntary activation of your nerves to your muscle, but they're usually at low frequency, under like, unlike a cramp, which would be at high frequency. And by far the most common reason for tetany is a low ionized calcium in the body. But there are other things that can also do it, such as hyperventilation, which might lead to low carbon dioxide, high phosphates, low magnesium. Essentially, though, you get uh, a metabolic derangement that allows for increased permeability of sodium ions in the nerves, and so you get depolarization and action potential, and essentially the muscle is cramping, uh, or at least contracting um, uh, at the time. Uh, so they're uh, diagnosing somebody with tetany, obviously, is physical exam again. There might be a bunch of labs you'd want to do, such as calcium labs, phosphate labs, and such. Um, you can actually hyperventilate people to see if you can create a tetany situation. 
And the most common type of tetany you're going to see is somebody with carpal pedal spasm. And this is a picture of a hand in which somebody hyperventilated and went into a carpal pedal spasm. It sort of looks like a dystonic posture. Essentially, the thumb will abduct towards the palm. The uh, 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 MCP joint is going to flex a little bit, but the extensor, extension in the PIP and DIP joints. So you have this sort of uh, 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 fingers that are flexed, but stiff fingers at the same time. And there's often wrist flexion for it. Anybody here seen carpal pedal spasm before? Somebody? I uh, saw it in the ER uh, uh, actually recently, the last time I was attending, of a young girl who hyperventilated uh, because she was having some other symptoms of something that were bothering her, and both hands went like this. It was quite remarkable. Um, other signs of uh, low calcium, though, that you can see in somebody uh, are both these signs, the Chavosca sign. I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly, but if you just tap over the carotid gland over the seventh cranial nerve, I'll show that again, you can make the uh, facial nerve contract. So that's a sign of hypocalcemia. And then another one is creating this carpal, pedal, this, uh, carpal spasm by using a blood pressure cuff which reduces oxygen to the limb, and you'll watch this hand uh, go into contraction here in a second. This is called Trousseau's sign, another sign of low calcium. I saw a case of this just the last time I was attending as well on the inpatient side. That was uh, quite interesting, Trousseau's sign. And they were status post a parathyroidectomy, so uh, hadn't had their calcium uh, managed uh, quite right yet. All right, moving down to the next one is something called motor unit hyperactivity. The idea here is that there isn't necessarily nerve damage to the point of denervation, but something wrong with the motor nerve that allows it to discharge involuntarily and give symptoms. And the type of things that you can see in people with motor unit hyperactivity are extra fasciculations, which is twitching underneath the skin. I'll show you a picture of that. Myokinia, which is group fasciculations that are frequent, and then finally something called neuromyotonia, which is the nerve actually discharging at 300 times per second. It's actually uh, quite painful and quite fast. And when people are having these reactions, their muscles get tight because they're having overactivation of the muscle. Um, physical exam and EMG are often helpful, and some diseases that would fall into this category are as simple as benign fasciculation syndrome. People have extra twitches. Sometimes it goes so far as to cause twitches and cramps in people, or cramp fasciculation syndrome. And then finally, people who have more of it, we refer to it as Isaac's syndrome, which is a hyperactivity of the nerves that cause pain and stiffness in people. Here's an example of a hand with a fasciculation, just sort of a single twitch. You see that it's not enough to actually move the thumb. It's not a big amount of nerve fibers, just a single uh, group of nerve fibers, small. So you see twitching, nothing else is moving. And then uh, here is somebody who has myokinia, and it will look like a fasciculation, except that it's just going to be quite a bit more pronounced and, uh, and continuous in just a second here. So now it's really going off pretty fast. And the look of a fasciculation versus myokinia is really an EMG look. Uh, you have to stick a needle in and see what you see. Um, and fasciculation uh, and myokinia looks a little bit different, but they are related in the cause. A question for the audience uh, here, and that is uh, the primary work or use of energy or ATP of a muscle is during what part of <laughs> movement? Contraction of the muscle, the resting state of the muscle, relaxation of the muscle, an isometric uh, tone of the muscle, or both A and B? What do you think? E, I heard, A and D, not correct. 
A is not correct. C. C is correct, actually. Relaxation is correct. Let me explain to you why that is, why we're using more ATP in relaxation than we are in contraction. It seems not correct, but in fact, we are. So here's a, a neuromuscular junction right here. So we have a, a acetylcholine that's released at the neuromuscular junction and binds to the muscle side. You get electrical activity that runs through the uh, surface of the muscle. And then we'll dive down. This electroactivity dives down something called T-tubules. There are lots of T-tubules here, and the T-tubules sit right next to our sarcoplasmic reticulum, which has a lot of calcium in it. And once there's this electrical autonomic action potential, you get release of uh, calcium into the uh, 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 sarcolemma here, and that's going to allow your actin and myosin to bind together and contract. But the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum runs down a concentration gradient that doesn't take any energy. As soon as the electrical signal goes through, your calcium is released and you get contraction of your muscle. Most of the energy in flexing and contracting your muscle is when you have to release the contraction because it's a very AT dependent, ATP dependent uh, situation to get your calcium back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now this is going to make sense when I talk about this term contracture, but what I'll show you is just a very fun video I saw here of uh, of our actin and myosin fibers. What they're narrating here is that you have calcium that's released from the psychoplasmic, uh, psychoplasmic sarcoplasmic reticulum. You have troponin, actin, and tropomycin. And the calcium is going to react with the troponin. The tropomycin then moves out of the way so that your myosin and actin can crosslink. That allows your myosin to attach to these binding sites on the actin and move the fibers down upon each other. That's how we contract our muscle. And this electrical signal they're showing here comes from the nerve. Acetylcholine receptors are activated. You get an all or none action potential that runs down T tubules and through the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which releases the calcium, which allows the calcium to bind and get the actin and myosin to contract. And the muscle contracts. So why do I bring that up at all? It is to explain what a contracture is. A contracture is in people with muscle disease in which they run out of ATP, and so their muscle actually stays in the contracted position and can't relax because they have no ATP in order to get the calcium back in the sarcoplasmic reticulum in order to relax their muscle. So it stays in a contracted state. And because this muscle is contracted and yet is not getting electrical signal, if you stick a needle into this muscle, it will be silent because there isn't any electricity running through there it just can't relax because it's without ATP. So this is often described by people as a cramp when they come in, when in fact it's not a cramp. It has nothing to do with extra electrical activity of the nerve. It's due to poor relaxation and a primary muscle problem, and it should be called a contracture. And it's most often seen in muscles that have used up their ATP when they have a metabolic myopathy, which is a muscle that can't keep up with its energy demands by making ATP and wears out. Often uh, can get rhabdomyolysis and other problems with this as well as weakness. And not to confuse this term contracture with what you've seen in people who have cerebral palsy or bad strokes and because they're not moving their arm enough their tendons just shorten and their arm stays at a contracted uh, place, but that's not quite the same thing as saying that this is a muscle problem. That's more of a tendon not being able to, to move out. 
So uh, to diagnose somebody with metabolic myopathies and contractures, you need a good history. Uh, muscle biopsies and labs can help. Again, if you had somebody that had a contraction, you stuck a needle in it, it would be silent, unlike a cramp. And diseases that you might come across that are metabolic myopathies include McCardle's disease, Fosfotrucotinase disease, carnitine palmitoyl transferase, or T uh, CPT deficiency, for example. These are metabolic myopathies. Moving down to something called myotonia, which also localizes to the muscle. And this is seen in people with disorders that can produce myotonia, most often the myotonic dystrophies and the myotonia congenitas, but can be part of some of the metabolic myopathies like acid maltase deficiency and such. Uh, but myotonia is, again, impaired relaxation uh, after, uh, from spontaneous repetitive depolarization of the muscle. So there's actually something electrically actively happening to the muscle, uh, just too much activation of the muscle uh, due to some problem with uh, a, a, a neurotransmitter uh, ion channel, probably. There are a number of different things that can happen. You can find percussion myotonia, grip myotonia, often improves with exercise. Uh, in myotonia congenita, it's often worse in the cold. I'll show you a couple of pictures of these, but to diagnose somebody with myotonia, you're looking at exam features. So for myotonic dystrophy down here, uh, there's often frontal balding and temporal wasting here. The eyelids are usually droopy because the, the, the weakness of those muscles there. Uh, for somebody with myotonia congenita, look at this young two-year-old. Looks like pocket Hercules there with lots of extra muscle you wouldn't expect in somebody who's so young. But here's an example of somebody with percussion and then grip myotonia. They just sort of hit the thenar eminence and you see the muscle just contract over the palm in a relatively slow way uh, and it will sort of just stay there. You have the ability to stretch it out again, but and then we're going to just show you what grip myotonia looks like. You have to have somebody grip something for a little while. It's not just a second, but you have them grip for five to ten seconds here. And then just say release very quickly, as quickly as you can. And you see that their fingers kind of get stuck. Usually you'd be able to just go like that. And people with myotonia sort of go like that as they go out. So it's just a poor relaxation problem. Uh, and if you were to stick a needle into a muscle, some of myotonia, and just sort of tap on the muscle or ask them to contract it a little bit, you start to hear these myotonic discharges, which are waxing and waning like a motorcycle revving up discharges to your ear on the EMG. And then the final weirdest, rarest one that I'll tell you about is just something called rippling muscle You've probably never heard of rippling muscle disease, or maybe you have, but um, this is a problem with the sarcolemma, so that calcium gets released without electrical signal from your neuromuscular junction. It's just sort of a poor ability for uh, the, the calcium to stay in. So the sarcolemma problem can often be pro provoked by tapping or stretching something. I'll show you a video of that that's pretty interesting. Um, but this uh, is often a genetic mutation, autosomal dominant, and for some reason, I'm not sure why this happens, but if you just look at the lipid bilayer of a uh, skeletal muscle and you look at the different components that make this up, like dystroglyphans and sarcoglycans and dyst uh, dystrophin, well, there are a lot of other proteins, and one of them is called caviolin-3, and most of the mutations that have been found for rippling muscle disease have been in the caviolin-3 gene. Diagnosis, again, physical exam, maybe labs for genetic testing. And again, because there's no electrical signal going down, it's just calcium being released without electrical signal. If you stick a needle into the muscle, you won't hear anything because it's electrically silent, even though it's contracting. And I'll just show you a picture, the best one I could find, of somebody with rippling muscle. He's sort of contracting his muscle a little bit, and now he's just going to lengthen it out. And you can just see these waves of ripples that go across 
his muscle there. I'll show it one more time since it was so short, but he's contracting it a little bit here. And then he just lengthened it out, and you can just see these waves of muscle fibers and mounding going across. So what's he complaining of? Just the rippling, or is he complaining of and Yeah, I've never seen anybody with rippling muscle disease. I don't know if anybody here, Mike, have you seen somebody? What did they complain of when they came in? Just that phenomena, or was it somehow painful, or? The patient I saw, it was, um, it was uncomfortable. Yeah. And we treated them. So the muscle is contracting, and it felt uncomfortable, and I, what did you, dantrolene or something like that? Because yeah. it's a sarcoplasmic reticulum problem. Yes, Patricia. Um, yeah, it's a muscle just contracting in waves across the system. Maybe release of calcium causes the next one to release calcium. The next one, it just sort of, it's, you know, spreading depression of, uh, in the brain or something. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, you would think you would. I think that's the most stunning thing, that this contraction you wouldn't see. But in fact, you're picking up electrical information on an EMG, and if there's no electrical activity that's activating this, just calcium actinomycin cross-linked, um, that you would not see the, the anything on that. Is that right, Michael? That's right. It's electrically yeah, silent. electrically silent. It seems odd that it would be, but it is. Well, you leave it in membranes to go against electrical. That's why you find it on the muscle. I didn't catch that. Okay, and then uh, we're near the end here. I'm going to be happy to take questions in just a second. But what I've done in the handouts that I've given people is that I've listed the different types of tone uh, according to where do they come from in the nervous system. I've also given you some definitions below that of what uh, each one of these things is defined as. And then on the back, I've given you a little table that just sort of compares central tone versus peripheral tone uh, with a little bit of information about each one. In general, in central tone, the distribution of the tone problem is going to be greater in your body, say one side of your body or one whole leg or one arm or something. In peripheral tone disease, it's usually a much more local function in, uh, in, the, uh, in the muscle. Um, and then, uh, usually in central disease, the length of the time that something lasts is usually on the longer side. It may be constant, like as in rigidity and spasticity, or uh, somewhat short, like tonic spasms. Uh, but it's usually going to be longer than things that uh, peripheral system disease, which are usually quite short when they occur. There's a lot of crossover there. So I'll just give you some thoughts about how to separate these things out. As I said, I find all these quite difficult to sort out in people when I'm listening to what their complaint is and trying to examine them and such. And uh, it was a nice exercise for me to put this together and think about it. Hopefully it'll be useful to you, but I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Paul. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Krauss, I was just wondering, on an EMG, can can you see increased tone that, that's actually voluntary from a patient if they're kind of contracting the muscles throughout the exam? You can. So the in continuous motor unit activity, somebody with stiffness, is just continuous motor units that you would see if you were just activating your muscle on your own and uh, they just can't relax. So that is a problem sometimes that they can't relax well enough. But somebody with continuous motor activity is probably in multiple muscles. And then the other thing you can do is if somebody is contracting the muscle, an agonist muscle, they have to be relaxing their antagonist muscle. And somebody with stiff person disease, because all their muscles are contracting at the same time, if you stick a needle in the agonist and antagonist, both still have the continuous motor unit activity. Uh, and it shouldn't be the case if they're just activating it on their own. Although although people can just isometrically tense up and do that on purpose. It's true if they knew what they were doing and the knowledge to try and fake something like that. So that's probably pretty hard. Can you repeat the question? Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, does somebody who just voluntarily activate the muscle look like 
uh, increased tone on the EMG in the same way that something pathologic would. Phil. Uh, I, I kind of think that uh, you know, a fair number of people with Parkinson's disease do have pain. Yeah, so the comment was that uh, Dr. Swanson has seen lots of patients with Parkinson's who have had pain. And I, I think that's true. It's not usually an early feature. And oftentimes when I've seen patients, the pain is when they get uh, wearing off dyskinesias of some kind, like a dystonia or something other than just the lead pipe rigidity. And I've also seen many of people with Parkinson's who are hunched over and therefore have this posture that gives them a backache or a leg ache or something as well. So there certainly are reasons for why people with rigidity and Parkinson's can have a pain component. I haven't usually seen it as a primary initial complaint that people have more of a later stage uh, complaint usually. Yeah, Michael. Eric, I'm sorry, I might have, I had to go out for a call. When you were talking about muscle cramps, did you talk about nocturnal leg cramps? Yeah, that's and, the, and and so how do how is the, what did you learn about I've always never I've never really gotten a good explanation for the pathophysiology compared to neurogenic muscle cramps and I wonder if you found some some reason to explain that I think there would be two ways that maybe to explain nocturnal cramps in the calf one is if you did have a peripheral neuropathy and therefore are set up to having cramps. Uh, just having this posture in bed where you might be activating something under the covers might just lead to more cramps at night. Uh, but, uh, but there also may be systemic metabolic things going on that might lead to it as well, like how much exercise you did during the day or dehydration or uh, some other uh, electrolyte. But no, I didn't read anything more specific about that. Thank you.